Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 people. It's Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, and I'm live. I'm live. I'm here, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, and guess where I am, people? I'm in Amsterdam. I'm in Amsterdam, and we're approximately, how long? We're approximately about 15 hours away from the first ODI between the Netherlands and West Indies. My voice might not sound like I'm excited, but I actually am, to be honest. Um, it was a bit of a, it was a big call. It was a big call to to make the decision to come to the Netherlands for the for the, for the whole week for the three games for the three ODIs. I took a gamble that basically no press were really going to cover this series. It's too small fry. Um, it's two of the minnows um, in 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 established world cricket, so to speak, and. I, I kind of knew that there would be no Caribbean press really and truly um, at these games. So I took it upon myself. You know, you live once, man. You live once. You've got to do it for the love of the game. The people the people in the streets are calling for it. They want to know that somebody is there giving them the, the kind of real blow-by-blow -blow accounts of what's taking place. So look out for the content. Look out for the content that we're going to be doing um, during the course of this week. I say we, me. That's going to be doing during the course of this week. Interviews. I'll be on the field. I'll be doing antics. You know, by now you should know what I'm like. Um, go and follow the Caribbean Cricket Podcast at Twitter at Carib Cricket, C A R I B Cricket, at Twitter and at Instagram. If you've been following the Instagram account today, for example, I've been kind of live updating the whole journey. I left London this morning at the train was eight o'clock this morning um, in London. Arrived after a massive delay, which is a story in itself. Arrived um, in Amsterdam about three o'clock local time in Amsterdam. And I've just kind of just been chilling out basically uh, since arrival, trying to get geared up for tomorrow. Um, so follow us at Carry Cricket, like I say, Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to kind of support all the uh, content that one, we've been doing anyway, but two, this, this trust me, this, this Netherlands thing isn't cheap. Um, quite a lot of money has gone into this. I'm not saying that anybody must refund me it, but I am saying if you do like what the Caribbean Cricket Podcast does, if you consider the kind of content that we produce vital or crucial in uh, the development of West Indies cricket and kind of getting the news out there, both for the people in the Caribbean and the diaspora, you can, of course, um, support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I always forget to bring this stuff up, but here it is on the screen. You can support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, www.patreon.com forward slash Carib Cricket for as little as two pounds, two dollars, two, whatever your currency is per month to just every little bit counts. Every little bit counts in terms of making this um, not worthwhile in so much as making money. I don't think we'll ever be making money off it, but certainly not losing money off the kind of work and um, things that we produce uh, on behalf of West Indies Cricket and for the people, obviously, so to speak. So do get behind the Caribbean Cricket Podcast if you can in any which way. But believe it or not, as much as I'm in Amsterdam and as much as I'm going to be covering the game tomorrow, do please follow the handles. Like I say, I'm going to be doing live updates. So as, as much as some of you might be YouTube fans and you'll kind of watch the stuff that we produce on YouTube, that will be done. Don't get me wrong. I will be doing that after each day's play and the updates and so on and so forth. But do lock in for kind of like the live stuff that I'm going to be doing tomorrow if the internet holds out. Um, but that's not actually the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video, as the title says by now when you're watching this, is to look at a review of round four of the West Indies um, four-day championship. Remember, as much as we're playing this ODI series versus the Netherlands, and of course we go straight to Pakistan as soon as this Netherlands um, tour is over, on the, the the team flies out on the Sunday, goes to Pakistan. The series has been moved to Moulton. They're going to play three um, ODIs in Pakistan. But on the horizon, people must remember that there is a test series due to take place against Bangladesh. Bangladesh will arrive in the Caribbean in June. Test series will commence in July. There'll be a warm-up game. There is 
rumors or say rumors i've been led to believe by people i trust that there will be an 18 series as well against us against us as and yet declared opponent i don't know if that's bangladesh i don't know if it's injury i don't know if it's south africa or whoever it may be but i've been led to believe there will be an a team uh, series as well in red ball cricket well and apparently white ball cricket for the a team as well but the point being going back to the, uh, the fact that this is a video about the four day championship we've just had round four conclude obviously if you're a fan of our youtube channel you've seen that i did a video um for the review of round three so we've just had round four conclude three three results. Leeward Islands beat uh, the Windwards by two Windward Islands by two hundred and twenty eight runs. Barbados smashed Trinidad by an innings and twenty two runs, and Jamaica and um, Guyana batted out to a draw and a lifeless pitch. Now, part of when I was creating, when I was thinking about oh, what are the talking points from this video, part of me was like, well, what talking points are there that I didn't already mention when I did the review of round three? But, you know, we've been, listen, it is what it is. If, if somebody is still, if somebody produces another performance that enhances what I've already said, so be it. That's the point of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, to talk about and promote those who are doing well. But like I did with round three, it's going to be a whistle-stop tour. So I'm going to run through each game and just talk about some of the key highlights out of those particular games, people to watch as we enter into round five. Remember, round five and the final round of the four-day championship commences in two days' time on Wednesday. Uh, it looks like the title is basically between Barbados and the Leeward Islands. One of those two will take it. Remember that Barbados play bottom of the table, Windward Islands, and Leeward Islands will play Jamaica, who are the second bottom. So it's really down to which of those two teams beats the weakest teams in the tournament well enough, but we shall see how it goes. So anyways, the first game I want to look at is the Leeward Islands versus the Windward Islands. Obviously, the Leeward Islands won by 228 runs. The kind of key talking points out of that particular game and the kind of players who we should be looking at. Um, first and foremost on the Windward, I mean, the Windwards have been dreadful. Uh, there's no point in trying to talk them up. There's no point in trying to pretend that they've been better than what I'm going to say. They have been beaten badly um, by pretty much every team they've played. Their batting has not stacked up at all. And there is a lot of work to be done by those in the Wimmer Islands think tank about how to improve the output from their batters. In this particular game, uh, it was good to see Kamani Melius, former West Indians under 19 talent, hit a 50. Uh, Kavem Hodge hit a 43. I mean... You want to see bigger numbers by Kavem, given particularly Kavim, I should say, given that he is one of those players who's kind of on the outskirts of the West Indies um, test squad, that he's got to hit higher numbers than that to really bring himself into consideration. Karen Katoy got a 73. I think that might be his second 50 of the tournament. So he got a 73 batting at number six. Um, and that was basically it for the women's. Nobody else really produced anything with the bat. So then you've got to look at the Leeward Islands and say, well, who were the star performers for them? Again, uh, Jeremiah Lewis, three for 26 in the first innings. I spoke about him in the last uh, round preview. He is a fast bowler that I want to see minimum in a West Indies A squad. We won't be able to tell if the numbers that Lewis is putting up um, are worthy of test selection if we don't at least try him in an 18 game so if that 18 series like i say is definitely going to go ahead that that i expect to see jeremiah lewis as one of the bowlers um in in that 18 uh setup against whoever it may be because he is probably based on the fact uh, based on the stats thus far in the tournament the best fast bowler in the in, in the tournament so we want to see him take the next step up and then uh jimbo 11 wickets in the match um, five for 61 in the first innings, six for 45 in the second innings. He also hit a 38 of 36 when the, um, was that in the first or I think it was in the first innings for Leewards. Listen, what do you say about Jimbo? We know what Jimbo can do. We know how good, uh, Jimbo is. And in fact, I haven't actually brought, I should have had my screen ready for this, but Jimbo is the leading wicket taker in, in the four day championship, 21 wickets at 19 is the leading wicket taker again. Remember that if you study the, the history of the four-day championship, particularly in the last five, six years, and I think I've written about this, I've done some um I've done some videos on this, it's either Cornwall or it's Permol. Cornwall or Permol. It's always those two in the one and two position in terms of top wicket takers. And currently, Cornwall is number one, Permol is number two. 
I don't know what to say about Jimbo. I think somebody tweeted me, and apologies, I forget your name for who exactly it was. They tweeted me and said, can Jimbo get back into the West Indies team? Now that he's out, does he work his way back in? And I said, yes, if he, like, sheer, if Jimbo puts up sheer numbers of wickets, sheer volume of wickets, he has to get himself back into consideration. There will be some who say that his drop was a bit premature. Uh, there'll be some who will say, given his weight, the drop was overdue. And this is a problem. I rate Jimbo. Everyone who knows me knows that I rate Jimbo. And I feel like the problem we had with Jimbo in the West Indies setup is we never put our full faith in him. I don't know if that's down to the weight. I don't know if that's down to the fact we can only really put him at slip. I don't know if that's down to the fact he's not mobile on the field. I don't know. But the point is, what Jimbo does do is he takes wickets and he wins matches for his team. And he's done that for the Leeward Islands versus the Windward Islands. The question that people have to ask themselves is, what does Jimbo have to do? And I put this out to those who are watching this. Whoever's watching this, in your head, what does Jimbo have to do to become a permanent fixture, fixture in the West Indies test side? If we are saying that the performances in the four-day championship matter, and let's say in this last round, Jimbo goes on to take another five, six, seven wickets, whatever it may be, and ends up as the leading wicket taker in the four-day championship, what does he have to do then to get into the West Indies setup again? Or are we saying that because of his weight, he can never make it back? That's not for me to answer. I'm just putting that out there for people to think about because currently he's number one. He's out bold per mole. Uh, at the moment in the tournament. So um, Jimbo's got 21 wickets at 19. Permol's got 19 wickets at 26 or 27. So Jimbo is out bowling Permol. That's not me trying to say that Permol should be dropped. Not at all. I think Permol has done enough to hold on to the position given he's the incumbent. But there is a big question mark about what Jimbo has to do to get back into the side. And particularly as Roston Chase is now dropped. So the argument about having another off spinner instead of Jimbo, which would usually be Chase, who obviously can't bat, um, that argument's done now. So what does Jimbo have to do to regain his position in the West Indies setup? That's for people to think about. Uh, put your comments below. You know, I always say with these YouTube videos, put your comments below and I will come back to them and I will answer them. I'll always get in the comments and go back and forth with people about what you think. Some other performances just to note from that Leeward, Leeward Islands performance. Jamal Hamilton returned to the team, got a 50. Colin Archibald hit an unbelievable 106 at number 10. Uh, if anything encapsulates how poor the Women's Islands performance was overall, it's the fact that they let a number 10 get a 106. I mean, well done to Colin Archibald. A, a century is a century. But if you're letting a number 10 get a 106, something's gone wrong with the bowling attack. That said, Pe Preston McSween, I spoke about him in the third round review. I've always been impressed with Preston McSween, the left arm pacer. He got a five for 92. Um, in the first innings, uh, bowling against the Leeward Islands. And again, another, and then one for 32, and so six wickets in the match uh, for Preston McSween. I've always been impressed by McSween. I, he's another player I want to see in an A team. I want to see if he can step up to the challenge of that, that level just underneath um, international cricket. Devon Thomas hit another 50. Again, it was another kind of, for want of a better word, one day aggressive innings, 51 of 45 balls. Again, same argument as Jimbo, really. Devon is putting up the runs. I know he ducked and ducked versus England in the President's eleven, but Devon is continuing to put up the runs, which means that if we're going to be fair, he deserves another chance to be in and around the test set up or at the very minimum in a West Indies A-side to see if he can produce this consistent... He's got 10450 so far in the tournament. Can he? We won't know if he can produce at a test level if we don't at least give him an A-team game or something to that effect. And also, some people have been talking about Denver, uh, the Wilmer Islands bowler, three for 62, two for 77, five wickets in the match. He's, he's one to watch, Denver. Uh, I think it's Kenneth Denver. Correct me if, I, if I've got that name wrong. Do correct me in the in the comments. He's one to watch. Um, first kind of paid attention to him, I think, in Super 50. I'll see how Denver goes, but he, he he's one to watch. Moving on to game two. Uh, Barbados smashed Trinidad by an innings and 22 runs. Let's deal with Trinidad first. This is now the what? Trinidad were poor with the bat in the last round as well. Who did they play? I think it was the Leeward Islands. So Leeward Islands smashed them and now Barbados has smashed them. Trinidad made 133 and I think it was 139 in their two innings. Nobody in the Trinidad side, Yannick Rye hit a 35 not out, but nobody really showed up. 
And it must be seriously worrying to David Furlong, the coach, and even beyond him, the Trinidad set up in general, what is going on with their batting. I keep seeing when I when I watch the Trinidad matches and I watched a bit, I watched quite a bit of their match against uh, Barbados. When I was in like the chats going back and forth for with people, there are loads of people rushing to go. And I think again, I think I said this after the third round. There are loads of people rushing to say, Oh, Bravo's finished, Bravo's finished. I don't think he is, but let's let me entertain that argument. Nobody in that Trinidad setup is batting well though. So I don't know why we're quick to write off Bravo who, don't get me wrong, he has got to find a way to get through this poor stretch. You know, that's like I say, that statement, um, form is temporary, class is permanent. Um, he's got to find a way to get through it. But the problem with Trinidad is, even if Bravo's flopping, they can't carry that because no one, I think, again, I think I said this, I feel like I'm repeating myself. No one is producing for Trinidad. Not Jason Mohammed, not Keegan Simmons, not Jeremy Solazano, not Darren Bravo. And then really and truly the only batters that have really done anything for them is Josh and Yannick Correa. And that, that you can't win matches if your whole top five or top four or whatever it is just simply aren't showing up. I mean, kudos to the, the Barbados bowlers, although one could argue how much are they, how much are people really having to bowl well to dismiss these Trinidad batters at the moment. Warwickon, three for 21. Greaves, Justin Graves, sorry, two for 26, three for 27. Uh, returning to the Barbados side with that kind of, um, I, I call it kind of slippery medium pace. Raman Simmons, who I called for in round three. I said that Barbados' bowling attack in round three versus Guyana was substandard. They fixed it for this game. The young the young pacer, left-arm pacer, Raman Simmons, came in two for 24. He looked sharp. I like the look of this young you. I want to watch some more of him. Akeem Jordan, again, five wickets in the match, two for 17, three for 32. And Roston in the second innings, three for 26. So it was a good all-round bowling performance by the Barbados team. And their bowling attack looked a lot more balanced um, with the with the inclusion of Simmons and even with uh, Justin Graves coming in and, and bowling some of his medium pace, they just looked a lot more balanced as a side. Notice how I didn't even mention Reefer there in terms of wickets column. Reefer went up to number three, hit a seventy nine. So Reefer for for for, for Ramon Reefer, I, I'd make the same argument as I make for Devon Thomas. Reefer has put up runs um, over a period of time now, and. <laughs> What do we say about Ramon Reefer? He always seems to be the number 12 um, or the 12th man. When are we going to give this guy a goal? I'm not saying that the sheer weight of runs means that he must get a goal over anyone else. But remember, in that President's Eleven game, he actually did score runs. If we keep pigeonholing Ramon Reefer as Jason Holder's understudy, this guy will never get a game. I think uh, our good friend of the podcast, Nikhil, said that Ramon has put himself now up the order at number three to show that he can make runs. And that's what I think is the way forward for him. He's got to go up the order and show that he can be selected as a pure batter alone. Remember, it's Shamar Brooks's place, which is the place that looks most at risk um, in this West Indies setup. So Reef has just got to keep on piling on the runs and maybe it will force the selector's hands. And then they can look at the fact that he also offers um, a medium fast option um, as well, kind of like a Carl Mayers. Uh, Justin Graves also hit a 50. And for Trinidad, their only standout performer really of the entire match was Terence Hines. Um, remember, Jaden Seals has gone off. Akil Hussain has gone off. Anderson Phillip has gone off. So Terence Hines got his chance to come into the Trinidad side, side and he responded with a 5 for 32. So uh, respect to Ter Terence Hines for that. And we'll see how he goes when uh, Trinidad play Guyana in the final um, match. And then moving on to um, the final game, um, the, 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 the board draw between Jamaica and Guyana. Jamaica batted first, 393. The West Indies vice captain... Uh, Jermaine Blackwood hit a 114. Nothing to really say there. Just good to see that the vice captain is in the runs and uh, has hit a bit of form. So obviously he'll be in the Bangladesh Test Match squads team, not even squad team. So just good to see Jermaine hit a 114. Shout out Alwyn Williams, uh, 51, and then Al Dane Thomas, 100. The Jamaican batting lineup, and I speak now as a Jamaican, there are a lot of question marks about Jamaica and their ability to bat, but they showed up, granted, on a flat deck, 
But remember, this was a team without Nkrumah Bonner, without Brandon King. And yes, Jermaine got 114, but it was good to see some of the younger understudies um, prove that they have ability. So like I say, Alwyn Williams, 51. Alden Thomas, a maiden, 100, uh, first class century, 100 as well. So good for him. Obviously, when Guyana then came to bat, they really showed how flat the deck was. I think they made 594, was it, for seven declared or maybe 598. And of course, the standout name, another century, Tej Narayan Shandapur. What do you want me to say, people? Tej is the second top run scorer in the competition now, just behind the, the captain of the West Indies, Craig Brathwaite. John Campbell, the current incumbent opener, is, if I'm not mistaken, he is about 25 runs behind Tej Narine in the run in the run order uh, or runs made order or whatever. That doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean. My thing is this. Anybody watching this, I already said after the round three review show that Tej has to be at least in a squad. If we're going to call things as we see it, through sheer weight of runs, 140 in the th round three, 184 in, in round four. He's currently averaging 83, I think, in the tournament. If the four-day championship matters, Tej has to get selected into a test squad as a backup opener at least. Will he get selected? I don't know. And hear, hear me out as to why. Because John hasn't done enough to warrant being dropped. Some of you will laugh when I say that. Yes, I know he flopped versus England, but what are they really going to recall John Campbell for a test match series versus England, granted he flopped, and say, that's it, you're done. Bear in mind in the four-day championship, he's got 100, he's got a 50, Just he got 98 in the second innings in this match, two runs away, obviously, from a, a century. Has John done, has John failed badly enough in the four-day championship to warrant not giving him another goal versus Bangladesh. This is a hard one because this isn't to do with Jamaican bias. It's just to do with the idea that if you call someone to a test squad, at least give them two series before you declare that they are a complete flop. I understand that some of you will say, but John's already had his goal before. Totally agree. But once you call him back, are you going to set the precedent and I speak to Desmond Haynes as uh, chief selector. I would have said Ronnie Sarwan, but if you're listening to this today and you don't know, Ronnie Sarwan has stepped down as a selector of the West Indies squad. I will do a video on that in due course. Once I do a bit more digging and speak to certain people, I will come back with a cuss out video on that because there, will, there must be a reason why Ronnie has done this. I don't know if I buy that. It's just personal reasons. I'll go do my research and come back with a video on that about why Ronnie may have stepped down. But anyways, as Chief Selector Desmond Haynes, you call back John Campbell and you say, right, he's the guy I want to go with. Uh, he fails in a three-match test series versus England, a couple of 30s, but he basically fails. Is one series enough for you to write off a player that you've just called back? I just don't think you can write someone off again after one series. I think you have to give them a second one. I think you have to. And if John fails versus Bangladesh, then you have your backup opener waiting, which is Tej Shandapur. I know some of you listening to this will say, forget John, drop him now and just bring Tej in. He's the man in form. He's the one putting up the big runs. Hear that 100%. But I just put this disclaimer. Tej has never played A-team cricket for West Indies. At least not that, not that I believe so. And if he has, it's not been extensive enough. If that A-team tests unofficial test series is going ahead this summer, like I've been led to believe. Is there any harm in selecting John Campbell for Bangladesh to see if he can actually produce anything and putting Tej in the A-team setup to see if Tej can make the next step from regional to A-team, which would then be A-team to test? Do we want Tej to miss out on the A-team completely and jump him into the tests? Of course, the flip side to the argument is, do you want Say John fails versus Bangladesh and he gets dropped. That would then mean, I think I said this again in the other show, that would then mean that Tej is debuting versus Australia in Australia. And we just found out today that one of those test matches in Australia is a day-night pink ball test match. Oh, my God. Tell you lot now, it's going to be a shambles, West Indies. It's going to be difficult enough to play there, let alone in a day-night match against the Australians. So do you really want to send a young Tej Shandapal to debut in Australia? So there's a lot of questions about this. Similar to Vasami Permol, who, by the way, took six wickets in this match, 
he, to me, her mole, has not done enough to warrant being dropped based on his first class returns in this four day championship. So even though he was kind of subpar versus, well, not kind of, he was, he was very subpar versus England, his performances in the four day championship since means I think you stick with the incumbent. Similarly, John Campbell, subpar versus England, but his performances since in round three and round four possibly hasn't done enough to justify dropping the incumbent. Like I say, not for me to make the decision, it's just for people to consider. But as I said, uh, in terms of Guyana, Tej 184, Hemraj 78, Imlak, another good young player who maybe now he's coming into his own and Guyana will actually invest in him properly, um, 79. Uh, Leon Johnson, 57, and Vishal Singh, who returned to the Guyana side, um, an unbeaten century, literally 100, not out. Um, Multi took four wickets, Permol took six wickets. We spoke about them last. We know what Multi and Permol can do. And Nicholson Gordon, the only Jamaican bowler who really showed up with four for 122. So people, I mean, that's it. That's a quick review show of, of round four. We head to round five, like I say, in 48 hours time. Um, let me find the fixtures again. Guyana will play Trinidad. They're pretty much locked into third and fourth. Leeward Islands will play Jamaica and Barbados will play Windward Islands. It will be down to Leeward and Barbados. Which one of them will beat their opponent better? Will Leeward Islands even beat Jamaica? Will Jamaica show up and prevent Leeward Islands even getting a victory? It looks very, very unlikely that the Windward, Island, Windward Islands will suddenly buck the trend of poor performances and manage to defeat Barbados. So if you're the Leeward Islands, you're trying to beat Jamaica, but beat them better than Barbados beat the Windward Islands and try and pick up some bonus points, fast bowling points, so on and so forth. But if you had to ask me right now, this is Barbados's tournament to lose. Um, they have the they have the strongest. Do they do they have a strong squad? They have a strong squad and certainly a squad that should not be losing um, to the Windward Islands. So they should seal this trophy. But I will return obviously after round uh, five to look at the overview of the entire tournament. But like I say, people, that, that that's my summary of round four. Like I said at the top, I'm in the Netherlands. Um, look out for content starting from tomorrow, people. When I'll get to the ground. Uh, for about 9 30 10 o'clock and start the content immediately but like i say i'm updating instagrams where you're seeing like the story in terms of the whole net let's call it like a tour diary where you're seeing like the whole story of what's been going on from our trips to netherlands thus far so do go over to the instagram account at, at carry cricket to really see the kind of hour by hour accounts of what's going on and the blow by blow but i will upload some videos starting from tomorrow obviously after the first day's play get on our twitter account for some live updates uh, like I say, I've got some players that I want to interview tomorrow, some key behind the scenes footage and, and all that. So do look into the Gabby Creek podcast. If you've only just come across us and you're like, who are these guys? And you're look, you're looking on the TV. There's no, there's no um, broadcaster for this Netherlands versus West Indies series. So we are your people um, to listen to and to follow, to get all the blow by blow updates from the Netherlands versus the West Indies. Ladies and gents, I've been Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, one half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, live in Amsterdam. See you tomorrow. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules coming. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket. By the fans, for the fans.